Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Update on Nanomaterials in Construction, Epidemiology, Exposures, and Awareness. Our presenters today are Bruce Lippe, Director of Safety Research at CPWR, Gavin West, Research Analyst at CPWR, and Mara Boatman, Project Coordinator at the State Building and Construction Trades Council of California. I'm going to hand it over to Bruce to get us started. Well, well thanks, Jess. I very much appreciate that. And, and thank you all for um, participating in this. I uh, thought you might like to see who's on the uh, other end here. So uh, these are the presenters. I'm going first. My colleague, Gav, will speak next. And Laurel will finish up um, third, and then we'll take questions as Jess indicated. So I'm going to talk about the, what are some of the highlights of the current state of knowledge on health effects of engineered nanomaterials as far as workers are concerned. Um, first, it's really important to establish my credentials here. Um, if we look at epidemiological expertise and we set a gondolier as a zero and a real epidemiologist, Carlo Capazzi, as a hundred, I come in uh, somewhere in this neighborhood, so uh, maybe more towards the gondolier. I'm an industrial hygienist, uh, unapologetically, that's what I do. Um, so it was uh, quite valuable to me to have slides learned graciously by Dr. Paul Schulte from NIOSH. He is the director of NIOSH's Educational and Information Division, um, and he gave an actually excellent presentation at the International Commission on Occupational Safety and Health this year in Dublin. And uh, we swapped slides, but I got the best part of the deal. Um, here's a shot of Paul inside the uh, um, dark conference uh, area moderating a session on nanotechnology while outside in the sunlight, amazing things were happening in Ireland. I took this picture of a beautiful rainbow, and, and there were trucks filled with Guinness beer just going up and down the roads in Dublin. So he's a real trooper and really stuck it out. I want to start with the slide that he put early on, too, and that is we have to think about um, these um, findings with nanomaterials that um, human epidemiological data is really still a very small subset of our knowledge on, on nano health effects. And if you look at this pyramid, what you're really uh, dealing with is that we're a small part. The, the animal studies, the inhalation and tracheal studies, are uh, more of those. And, and the majority of what we see out there are mechanistic uh, in vivo and, and particularly in vitro studies. So um, what, what the, the good news is, as I hope this presentation will show, is that we're really getting more information and, and learning more uh, all the time about actual human health effects and there are epidemiological data. Dr. Schulte noted the importance of what he calls legacy engineered nanomaterials like carbon black. These are important materials for several reasons. One is they're manufactured in very large quantities uh, compared to a lot of the other nanomaterials. Carbon black, for instance, 9.6 million tons manufactured worldwide. Um, and also, they've been manufactured for quite a long time, greater than 80 years uh, with this particular material. Now, they're not strictly what one would call uh, an engineered nanoparticle of 1 to 100 uh, nanometers in size. The primary particle range can be anywhere from 10 to 500. You get lots of aggregates and agglomerates, but um, this is one of the ones that we do have some data on workers. And, and the carbon black workers uh, do show alterations in the respiratory function, and also they, they show uh, changes as far as inflammatory cytokines. There's strong epidemiological evidence of association of non malignant respiratory disease and decreases in the uh, pulmonary function of workers, as well as symptoms of chronic bronchitis. You can see the studies that are listed there. Um, it's also important to understand that it's, it's animal studies that corroborate this have, have also shown that there are um, um, health effects associated with carbon black. However, the lung cancer evidence for uh, carbon black is inconsistent. The worker that you just saw is from the 1940s in Texas. You might have noticed he was uh, smoking a cigarette. 
the, the International Agency uh, for Research on Cancer in 2010 uh, indicated that after looking at all the industry-based case control studies, cohort studies, and community studies, uh, that, that there was some information. Seven of 13 were considered uh, informative for lung cancer. And by the way, three of those were in production workers. But these were generally small cohorts, uh, and, and cigarette smoking certainly could have been a uh, confounding factor. Um, it is important that animal studies do support that carbon black can cause uh, some lung issues as well. Another material that's been manufactured in large quantities is synthetic amorphous silica. Um, primary particles are really mostly in the nano material range, less than 100 nanometers. This material is intensely manufactured. Uh, it forms aggregates and agglomerates. Uh, there really isn't an issue with measurable levels of crystal and silica. Uh, and again, this is a material that's been manufactured more than 60 years, uh, but not comprehensively studied. There are case studies, however, and this one uh, was done by Son and colleagues, including Vince Castanova uh, from NIOSH, and they showed that pulmonary fibrosis inflammation and pleural granuloma were present <clears throat> looking at uh, seven female workers uh, with various uh, ranges of age from 18 to 47 years of age. Uh, they were exposed to these silicon nanoparticles, very small size, 2 to 20 nanometers. The team used electron microscopy to look at these particles in lung tissue, and they concluded, given the well-documented toxicity of microscale silica, it is possible that these silicon nanoparticles may have contributed in part to the illness reported in these workers. Many nanomaterials have little or no toxicological or epidemiological evaluation. Aluminum oxide is used considerably, no epi studies. Zinc oxide, no major epi studies. Barium titanate, a fairly high production level, but no documentation of occupational exposure or animal, animal inhalation studies. Serum oxide is used in, in a broad array of applications but um, not much in the way of epidemiological studies. <clears throat> and again, we're not talking about uh, craft beer brewing here. These are significant quantities that are missing the epidemiology. Uh, I mentioned carbon black synthetic and more silica, 1,500,000 tons a year, according to the World Health Organization. Not much in the way of epidemiology. Aluminum oxide, 200,000. Uh, so, uh, we're seeing these materials in much larger quantities than most folks think, and we're seeing some, some um, real absence here of uh, epidemiological studies. A recent epidemiological study of pain dioxide workers reported that they, they had significant markers for oxidative stress, which was the lipid oxidative markers. Um, there was also work done uh, by researchers uh, uh, on Chinese manufacturing, and these were employees uh, manufactured nanotitanium dioxide in a plant in eastern China, and Zhao and colleagues reported that they found significant dose-dependent increases in biomarkers. Uh, and they also saw cardiovascular disease markers. Uh, epidemiological studies for carbon nanotubes um, definitely showed cellular changes. These are um, studies where they controlled, uh, uh, they had controls for uh, multi-wall carbon nanotube workers, 10 exposed, 12 non-exposed. And the exposed population showed um, significant increases in inflammatory cytokines, and they showed a marker for lung disease in the study in 2016, um, Russian uh, researchers. Uh, Anna Svedova uh, from NIOSH looked at eight multi-wall carbon uh, workers, uh, nanotube workers who were exposed and seven non-exposed that were matched, and they saw um, dysregulated messenger RNA and mitochondria RNA. So uh, this is associated with pulmonary inflammation. Um, 
There was a recent 2017 cross-sectional study that showed early effects on lung health and immune system among multi-role carbon nanotube workers. Uh, again, 22 uh, workers and, and 39 age-controlled matched uh, workers, and it saw a significant uptrend, uh, upward trend in immune and pulmonary markers. Dr. Schulte concluded from his presentation that engineered nanomaterials need to be considered by type with regard to health effects, and that generally there are a few studies of health effects on contemporary engineered nanomaterials materials, but uh, there's some good ones for legacy uh, engineered nanomaterials. Also that we need to take next steps and further the study uh, of worker populations, as well as conducting animal studies to, to corroborate the, the worker findings, and, and also to assess biomarkers across studies as well as within them to see how valid they are. Dr. Schulte recommended we keep uh, thinking about a precautionary approach to these materials, which I think is warranted, as does the World Health Organization that uh, in this 2017 guidelines that a precautionary approach should be taken and we really need to apply the hierarchy of controls. So I'm going to turn it over now to Gavin West. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, I appreciate that, and we're going to dive into this next section here, and we'll be talking about the latest exposure and control findings uh, by CPWR. The workers can be exposed to chemical hazards across the life cycle of building materials, from the production of drywall, as shown on this slide, all the way to the end of life phase, which involves demolition, disposal, and recycling. CPWR researchers are investigating exposures to nanomaterials during routine installation and maintenance activities. So our first study involved cutting, drilling, and nailing of photocatalytic roofing tiles, like you see on this slide. Uh, that study was published in 2016 in the Journal of Nanoparticle Research, if you're interested to read more about what we've done previously. Our second study measured exposures while spraying and sanding a wood sealant containing nano zinc oxide. Uh, results from that study were published last year in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Hygiene. Today, what I'd really like to focus on uh, is our most recent study. So I'd like to share the results of that study that was published just last month in the same journal, in JOEH. So let's, let's begin with a, brief, uh, with a brief background and the rationale for conducting the study. CPWR has identified approximately 600 construction products that are reported to be nano-enabled. You can learn more about how nanomaterials are being used in construction by visiting the inventory uh, and the website, which also has some informational resources and guidance documents at nano.elkosh.org. So we, we shared some of the findings from the inventory in CPWR's construction chart book. And this pie chart shows that more than half of the products in the Elkosh nano inventory are paints and coatings. Uh, the pie chart also shows some of the other types of products in the inventory, such as insulation and cement. Uh, if you're not familiar with the chart book, I, I highly recommend that you check out the new six edition, which is available online. and uh, Perhaps the best part is it's free as well. So I, I would recommend that resource very highly. It's one of our uh, most widely used. The chart book also shows that nano-sized metal oxides, uh, such as titanium dioxide, are frequently reported in the Elkosh nano inventory. Um, and with regard to potential health effects, as Bruce was talking about earlier, NIOSH has recommended exposure limits, RELs, we might refer to them as that, for several nanomaterials, including carbon nanotubes, carbon nanofibers, and titanium dioxide. In addition, a revised draft for silver nanomaterials was posted very recently in September. Uh, one thing that was interesting with that was that based on new evidence acquired in recent years, the, re the revised draft recommends an exposure limit more than 10 times lower for silver nanomaterials compared to total silver, uh, which, which was uh, uh, different from, from the initial version that was, was uh, posted. Uh, similarly, 
the recommended exposure limit for nanoscale titanium dioxide is eight times lower uh, compared to fine titanium dioxide, as you can see from, from the values on the slide. So ultrafine titanium dioxide, uh, TiO2, we uh, will refer to it that way as well. Um, so the ultrafine TiO2 includes engineered nanoscale titanium dioxide and was, uh, it was also classified as a potential occupational carcinogen. Um, so based on this background information I shared with you in terms of the, uh, the frequent uh, use of uh, nanomaterials and paints and coatings uh, in our inventory, um, some of the health effects information, uh, we obtained a commercially available paint containing nanotitanium dioxide for testing. Objectives of the study were to measure exposure to nano TiO2 while painting and sanding, uh, painting and sanding to examine the potential release of unbound TiO2 nanoparticles and to evaluate the effectiveness of engineering controls in reducing exposure. The study took place in a sealed chamber with HEPA filtered air. So the HEPA filter supply is highlighted by the box with red dashes on the left side of this diagram that shows the setup while spraying. Here are some actual photos of the chamber where the paint containing nano TiO2 was sprayed on a plywood and then sanded by a tradesperson wearing full protective gear. The airless sprayer is shown on the left and uh, the power sander is hooked up to local exhaust ventilation on the right. Sanding was also performed without local exhaust ventilation and using unpainted boards for comparison. Uh, in terms of our methods, the particle size distributions were measured with real-time instruments shown here, specifically a TSI scanning mobility particle sizer coupled with an optical particle sizer. We also used standard industrial hygiene methods to obtain mass concentrations of dust and metal. Finally, scanning electron microscopy was used to more carefully examine particles in terms of their chemical composition, shape, size, and number. Before we did any sampling, we sent a sample of the paint to the laboratory to confirm the presence of nano TiO2 in the test paint, as shown here in the middle panel. The lab performed the same analysis using a conventional paint of the same brand to confirm that it did not contain any nano TiO2 as shown in the right panel. So using scanning electron microscopy, the lab estimated that 84% of the titanium dioxide particles in the paint were less than 100 nanometers. Um, and dur during the spraying, the real-time instruments detected nanoparticle emissions. Uh, the same was true during all sanding conditions, as you can see from the blue lines below the 100 nanometer cutoff. Uh, however, uh, electron microscopy did not detect unbound nanoparticles in the air samples we collected during spraying. So rather, what, what, what we observed, and as what you see on this slide, titanium particles were contained within or protruding from the, the paint globules. Uh, the same effect was observed with the sanding debris, as you can see on this slide. Uh, for comparison, Sanding debris from unpainted plywood is shown on the left, where the bright white specks of TiO2 are no longer observed. Larger copper particles, or this one shown here uh, with a diameter around one micron, uh, were also detected in air samples collected during sanding. Despite some of the limitations of the real-time instruments, they were able to show a statistically significant reduction in airborne nanoparticle emissions while using local exhaust ventilation. Uh, this is during sanding, and that's in comparison to the dust collection bag that came with the sander. So uh, this was despite the fact that dust levels during sanding were actually quite low. Uh, the highest concentration of total dust during sanding was about five times lower than the OSHA permissible exposure limit. And for titanium dioxide, the highest breathing zone concentration was detected while sanding painted boards with the dust collection bag shown on the right of this slide. But there was actually no restful TiO2 that was detected while sanding. But one thing you might be asking yourself at this point is, uh, 
what about what about the TiO2 embedded within the larger dust particles and, and paint globules like those I, sh I showed you earlier? So to better understand the risk of mixed exposures in construction, we teamed up with Dr. Jenny Roberts from NIOSH, who has been using samples and data from our studies to conduct in vitro and in vivo toxicity research. Another finding was that breathing zone concentrations were much higher when spraying versus sanding. So the mean concentration of respirable TiO2 shown here was over twice as high as the NIOSH REL for ultrafine TiO2. But an important question is what fraction of, of the respirable TiO2 was nanoscale? Uh, revisiting the electron microscopy results and putting some parameters on the data helped to answer this question. So based on the 95% confidence interval for respirable TiO2, we estimated that the upper limit of exposure to nano-sized TiO2 while spraying uh, to be three times the NIOSH REL for ultrafine TiO2. So that would be the upper limit based on the respirable estimate. We also calculated that there would be potential to exceed the REL if more than 0.84% of the airborne particulate while spraying was nano TiO2 by weight. So although the nanoscale fraction of TiO2 by weight was unknown, uh, or undetermined rather, we knew that 38% of the total particulate was TiO2, 33% was respirable by weight, and, uh, and in addition, um, it's important to point out that the NIOSH REL does apply to agglomerated nanoparticles, and, uh, and we can revisit the findings I showed earlier with the lab estimating that 84% of the TiO2 primary particles in the paint were nanoscale. Uh, last but not least, one of the anonymous peer reviewers of our paper astutely pointed out that nano-sized additives for coatings are typically added in the range of approximately 1 to 5 percent by weight. So what does this all mean? Uh, we weighed all these factors together, and in the paper we concluded that there was evidence suggesting potential for overexposure to nano TiO2 during routine construction activity in reference to the NIOSH REL for ultrafine TiO2. Again, that is uh, 0 0.3 uh, milligrams per meter cubed as a 10 hour TWA during a 40 hour work week. So, what, it, what the study recommended based on, on those findings and conclusions, uh, the recommendation was to characterize exposures and to use a hierarchy of controls to ensure the painters are sufficiently protected. Um, as, I mentioned, as I brought up on the last slide, this is a good time to remind everyone that we were measuring task-based exposures, whereas the NIOSH REL is a time-weighted average over the course of a work week. So among other things, that means that administrative controls, such as work scheduling, could be another way of reducing exposures to below the, the REL. An EU OSHA fact sheet that was posted on Elkosh Nano just last week offers similar guidance by recommending that spraying of nanomaterials in liquid media should be avoided as nanomaterials may be inhaled in the aerosol. Uh, now I'd like to hand things over to Laura Boatman, who's going to talk about awareness and training needs among the California construction trades. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Just waiting for the PowerPoint to come up. Oh, it, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Have to click on it because I had brought it up. Hold on. There we go. Okay, well, thank you, Gavin, Bruce, and Jessica, and hello, everyone. I'm bringing a slightly different take on nano to the table here. Um, hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. I'll be presenting key findings from a study we completed last May that looked into levels of nanotechnology awareness among union construction trades. We sought a perspective on nanotechnology from the end user point of view. Uh, first, I want to identify who we are. For over a century, State Building and Construction Trades Council has been the Labor Federation representing the California building trades. 
We represent 160 trade union affiliates from 14 different crafts, 125 joint apprenticeship training committees, and about 400,000 unionized construction workers throughout California. And we are an affiliate of North America's building trades unions. For the past 18 years, I've coordinated safety and health training programs for the California building trades. So California is recognized globally as being a hub of high-tech industry, research, green building, as well as a leader in worker health and safety standards and environmental protection. Our unions and contractors take great pride in being leaders in state-of-the-art construction. So as nanotechnology and nanomaterials increasingly manifest in construction, we would expect California to be on the cutting edge. But is this really the case? Is nanotechnology even on anyone's radar screen? As one interviewee says, if you were to walk up to the average construction worker and say, hey, can you explain what nanotechnology is in products and construction, they'd look at you like you were crazy. Even though nano-enabled construction products are being introduced into the U.S. market, typically bringing up nanotechnology among construction stakeholders generates blank stares. To our knowledge, no one had really asked construction stakeholders in California what they know about nanotechnology. This prompted us to apply for funding through CPWR's small study grant program to engage our unions, apprenticeship programs, and employers about the subject. We wanted to know if nanotechnology research by NIOCH and CPWR and product developers was actually filtering down in a meaningful way to people on the front lines of construction. Our final study report is available online through CPWR, and you can use the link shown here on the slide or go to cpwr.com homepage and search for nanotechnology and you'll be able to access the report. So the goals of our study are shown here on the slide. We wanted to gather feedback on general awareness, training, emerging concerns, learn if nanotechnology is garnering any attention, and if there is awareness of specific nano-enabled products. Additionally, we wanted to talk with professionals working in public agencies that would likely have oversight of new nanomaterials coming to market. We gathered data through both online surveys via a SurveyMonkey platform and key informant interviews. Both the survey questionnaire and key informant questions are included in the study report. We recruited study subjects from our affiliates, apprenticeship programs, and trainers who had participated in our Safety Train the Trainer classes. We reached out to three major contractor associations also to help recruit their affiliates. We collected 253 completed surveys and conducted 26 key informant interviews by phone five of which were with government agency representatives. So our first surprise was the level of response we got to the online survey. We set a goal of 100 surveys and expected it would be a challenge to get that many responses. In the end, we got more than double that response. This pie chart shows a breakdown of who participated in the survey. 70% were apprenticeship or union reps, the blue and dark green wedges. The light green wedge represents craft workers. And we had hoped to have more contractor reps participate. We have no way of knowing why that number is low. Many who did participate had attended our safety training classes. The demographics shown here give a profile of survey participants. There are no real surprises here. It's consistent with what we would expect of our target population. We have very experienced journey level workers, the majority of which provide training. What stands out is our success in getting a cross-section of crafts. These include the 15 construction crafts plus specialty crafts covered under those unions. For example, if you look at the International Union of Painters and Allied Crafts, that includes painters, glazers, wall covers, floor installers, drywall finishers, and more. So that's how we ended up with the 23 you see there. We wanted to get as specific as possible in identifying the type of work respondents represent. So now we'll look at some key findings from the study. Beginning with awareness levels, we had to establish a clear starting point. We tested four common terms that would be recognizable to anyone with a basic awareness of nanotechnology. Those are nanotechnology, nanoparticles, engineered nanomaterials, and nano-enabled materials, as you see on the bar graph. This was a check all that apply question. We see that a good number of respondents knew all of the terms. We treated the 48 subjects who had never heard of any of the terms as having no awareness of nanotechnology, and at that point, those subjects automatically skipped forward to the LCOSH nano inventory at the end of the survey. So we were really optimistic that 205 respondents indicated some awareness, but we had no way of knowing the nature of this awareness or its relationship to construction. 
when we ask key informants what is the first thing that comes to mind when they hear nanotechnology, we got a wide range of responses from very small size to robots, particles, and futuristic. Respondents were hard pressed to give a clear explanation of nanotechnology. So as we probe deeper with more specific questions about participants' knowledge, awareness declined sharply, with only a quarter of survey participants knowing that nanotechnology even applies to construction. As shown in the last three bullet points here, when we looked at firsthand knowledge of actual nanomaterials being used in construction, numbers dropped significantly to just a handful of respondents. Only 13 survey subjects indicated they had knowingly worked with a nano-enabled product on the job. Next, we looked at training. Based on relatively, the relatively shallow level of awareness indicated, we would not expect to find much in the way of training. These results back that up. In fact, only five individuals indicated they had received training related to nanotechnology. We see in the first column that four of these came from the insulator trade and had received product-specific training. We later talked with these individuals as key informants and learned the training they had received was delivered by the manufacturer and centered around product benefits and application techniques versus the use of nanotechnology. They still had many questions and concerns after receiving this training. The good news is that survey subjects are very interested in learning more and receiving nanotechnology training. The list shown in column three indicates a clear need for comprehensive, objective training about this new technology, its application in construction, and its potential to cause harm to workers. At this point, we have more questions than answers. One key informant told us, I think it's something amazing what they're trying to create. I really believe that one day we're going to be applying some of these products, but then again, how can we be prepared to train the construction worker that's going to crash into the high-tech industry? We found cautious optimism about nanotechnology among key informants, a willingness to accept and welcome new technologies to advance the industry while also wanting to inform and protect workers. The same caution manifested in the survey as well when we used a rating scale to assess perceptions of benefits and concerns. Three statements are shown here. It is significant that a majority of respondents to these questions indicated they either did not know or were neutral. Those who took a position tended to strongly agree that nanotechnology has potential benefits while also agreeing that nanomaterials may pose a risk to workers and the environment. Similar concerns emerged in follow-up key informant interviews. One person expressed it this way, we're always behind the curve on the safety factors. Because these new products get pushed out there on all of us, we will probably work with it for years before we realize if there's anything that could be harmful for us. Other concerns that emerged from the surveys and key informant interviews are shown here. These concerns center around a lack of specific information about long-term effects of nanomaterials on humans and ways that construction workers will be exposed to these materials while performing their job tasks. Comparisons were made to silica and asbestos exposures. Particularly among the insulators, the experience and history of asbestos exposures resulted in a wariness about new materials introduced into the trade. We heard that some insulators have refused to work with the new nano-enabled insulation material. This quote comes from an electrician key informant. Anything NAN creates has some kind of potential impact to nature and the environment. And I don't think really much is known about the possible implications of the stuff being made and what it could do. It's new technology. We're creating something unnatural. With the exception of the insulators, very little was known about specific products. Another goal of our study was to test the Elkosh Nano Inventory, which Gavin spoke of in his presentation. At the time we did the study, there were just over 500 products on the list. As we were developing our survey, some advisors thought we were crazy to ask survey takers to review such a daunting list. We believed it was important to include, even if our limited survey platform made it a bit cumbersome. And the screenshot shows an excerpt of what survey takers viewed. We were thrilled that over 70% agreed to review this list. I think by this point in the survey, people were pretty curious. The key finding here is that despite the very low awareness levels we discovered, 44% of those who reviewed the inventory recognized products. The majority of these products fell into the eight categories you see listed on the slide. This would seem to indicate that construction workers are using nano-enabled products without knowing it, and with rare exception without being trained about nanotechnology. 
When we discussed nano-enabled products with a plumber pipe fitter key informant, they said, I would assume that before any product comes out containing nano, it's going to be somewhat regulated by agencies like OSHA and underwriters' laboratories. I would think that any products used in the industry will be first vetted by agencies to make sure they're not harmful. But that wasn't the case with silica or asbestos. So as part of our study, we talked with some government agency reps and learned some interesting things about the state of nanotechnology oversight. We spoke with five key informants working for four California agencies. These agencies have potential for monitoring, regulating, and controlling nanomaterials with regard to occupational health, public health, and environmental protection. The informants were scientists, engineers, researchers who had experience with multi-agency nanotechnology working groups. The four common themes shown here emerged across all five interviews. 10 to 15 years ago, there was a wave of activity of funding and funding for nanotechnology initiatives and research. That has now subsided and none of the informants were aware of any current programs, public outreach, training, or information campaigns. All commented that government monitoring research cannot keep up with the rapid pace of product development. As we heard in Gavin's presentation, the LCOSH Nano Inventory has now grown to 600 products when it was at just over 500 when we did the study. Across the board, informants indicated a need for more information about materials, specifically citing a lack, a lack of epidemiological data, specific health effects of nanomaterials had not been scientifically elucidated yet, nor was data available relative to the complete life cycle of these products from production to use to disposal. There are currently no permissible exposure limits specific to nanomaterials. However, certain CalOSHA performance standards, such as respiratory protection, hazard communication, injury illness prevention program could be applied. To the respondents' knowledge, no issues regarding nanotechnology and construction had been brought to CalOSHA. Those we interviewed had little to no information about applications of nanotechnology in construction. So in summary, we found awareness levels to be low, the need for information, data, and training to be strong, and products are being created faster than we know about them. We generated several recommendations shown here as a result of our study. They're all interconnected and support one another. Primarily, we need to continue our efforts to study this topic and increase nanotechnology awareness among the construction trades. We need comprehensive training that will help demystify nanotechnology. We need more information about the products that are reaching the U.S. market and how they are being applied in construction. Many people told us that simply participating in our study had increased their awareness and their desire for more knowledge. Uh, here's my contact information. I'm happy to uh, take emails from anybody who's interested in the study. I encourage you to, again, go to CPWR's website and take a look at the full study report. Thank you. All right, thank you to Laura and all of our speakers. Um, we have a few questions, and anyone with any further questions, please feel free to enter them now. Um, the first uh, is, I believe, for Gavin. Um, can you discuss a little bit about the NIOSH REL applying to agglomerated nanoparticles? Sure, yeah, I'd be glad to. So um, it's a great question. And uh, this was a very important part of our interpretation of our results was, was whether the, the, the REL does apply to agglomerates. So um, if, if you go look at the current intelligence bulletin, the, the key passage there is where they define the definition of ultrafine. That's the nice thing of doing a webinar. I actually pulled it up here so I won't misquote what is written. So ultrafine is defined as the fraction of respirable particles with a primary particle diameter of less than 0.1 microns or less than 100 nanometers. And it follows that up by saying that particles less than 100 nanometers are also defined as nanoparticles. So that's the key part. And uh, uh, for those, um, for a little bit more background on the, on the terms, when we're talking about agglomerated particles, we're referring to uh, uh, individual particles, which we would refer to as the primary particles, like in, in the definition here, that, that are loosely bound together. Um, and so, so that was what kind of tipped us off to that. But since it was an important point, that's something that we had also uh, discussed with some of our, our NIOSH colleagues who, 
who confirmed our our reading and interpretation of of, of the current intelligence bulletin. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, thank you. Our next question is, um, how do NIOSH's REL's compare to ACGIH TLV's nanoparticles, for example, TiO2? Sorry, Jess, can I add one follow-up point to, to, to the answer there? There was one thing I wanted to mention quickly. Uh, the, the, I was going to say that uh, it, it does apply only to uh, restorable agglomerates. Um, and, and so that should have been a qualifier that I had mentioned, but when we were talking about it on that slide, we were discussing it in the context of the restorable fraction, but re restorable agglomerates um, in the CIV. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, as a follow-up question to that, actually, before you answer the next one, um, someone just uh, said, not sure if they missed this part, but can agglomerated particles break down into nan nanomaterials? Uh, yes, uh, the, the question is yes. Yeah, it, you know it, that that can happen, and and actually that was one of the things that we discussed in our study. So if can I control the slides, Bill? If I go back, um, you know, to that to the slide where we had the the character oh, the characterization of the bulk materials, that was exactly what the laboratory did was they were interested in sizing the primary particles. And so uh, what they did was they, would they used the uh, acetone preparation. So the first shows the sonication in water. Um, they didn't see any breaking apart of the agglomerates. Um, and they sonicated in acetone and did see that. We wanted to make sure we didn't see the same thing uh, with a conventional brand of paint on, on the right panel there. Um, so that was how the, the laboratory used the method they used to, to uh, examine the primary particles. And, and, and what we discussed in the context of the paper is that, okay, is, you know, that's what they're seeing in the lab. Could we see something similar in construction where, uh, you know, acetone and other types of ketones can be actually used as paint thinners? So would that be something uh, that, that, that could translate into the real world as well where if, uh, some nano-enabled paints are thinned using some type of ketones, you know, maybe atomized with a spray gun or agitated in, in a mechanical paint mixer, you know, could that replicate some of what we were seeing in the lab under normal kind of construction activity? So that's a great question. Okay, thank you. And going back to the previous question that I asked, um, which I'll repeat, um, was how do NIOSH's REL's compare to ACGIH TLV's nanoparticles, for example, TiO2? Uh, Bruce, feel free to pitch in. My, uh, my, my understanding was that uh, ACGIH does have a TLV for titanium dioxide. Uh, I believe that was uh, around 2000 um, was maybe the latest, uh, the year 2000 was around the latest, but Bruce, I don't know if that applies to nano size TiO2. Do you know? I, I, I do not. I have not really kept up on what ACGH is doing as far as the, uh, their TLVs for, for nanomaterials. Sorry. Yeah. My, my impression was that they do not have one for titanium dioxide. Uh, this summer, um, the, they had announced plans at one point to proceed with a TLV for carbon nanotubes, which NIOSH does have a REL for carbon nanotubes. But I think this summer it was um, announced that that was placed on their their second tier uh, in terms of uh, proceeding with TLVs. So my understanding is that would mean that, uh, you know, I, I guess a decision would be made next year on whether to proceed or not. It does look like 2019 for carbon nanotubes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next question is, um, what is the appropriate respiratory protection when handling nanoparticles? Is CPWR planning to compile a database of available air sampling results? I guess those are two separate questions. 
Uh, this is Bruce again. Um, NIOSH has done a considerable amount of uh, testing and has found that um, high efficiency filters uh, will keep uh, will work for nanoparticles too. There's been a lot of concern, particularly among workers, that uh, when we define um, what a, a heap of filter, what a high efficiency filter is, we use the, the particle size of 300 nanometers as the most difficult to capture. Um, and, and they're saying, well, the smaller particles that are going to go through like they might in a screen door, but uh, the, the filters are torturous path. And uh, NIOSH has done a, a fair amount of work to, to demonstrate that they, they are effective uh, against uh, nanoparticles. The other question is that we, we are publishing our data in all of our papers. Um, if someone's interested in, in raw data, we'd be happy to talk to them. Um, but, uh, you know, basically we summarize the data and put it into uh, the, the three peer-reviewed publications we now have. And I, just a follow-up question about the three peer-reviewed um, articles. Is there another one coming out, or is all of your um, research at this point published? Uh, it, it, it's all published. It just made it. Uh, Gavin was the lead author on the, the last paper that, uh, that he pointed out dealing with the titanium dioxide paint. And I, I would point out this paint was, was not, uh, we just went to Home Depot nearby and bought it off the shelf. This is commercially available paint, and that's the last one we did. Okay. Great. And so for the... There will be more. Oh, go ahead, Gavin. I was just going to say that we'll, we will be doing continuing with our testing though. So uh, oh, yeah. eventually, Thanks. yeah, look for more to come. Yep. Okay, great. And for the folks asking, um, I will uh, try to send out the links to those articles. Um, in the, I should be sending a follow-up email tomorrow, um, again, with a recording of today's webinar, as well as a PDF of the slides and other resources. Great, and, and send them a link to Elkosh Nano as well. I very much appreciate it. Yes. Okay, um, one, uh, actually a couple more questions. Um, the next question is what methods are used for measuring nanoparticles in the workplace? I know there are methodological problems. Let's um, Bruce, when we do testing in the chamber, we don't do actual measurements in, in workplaces. We, we did that initially with the uh, uh, work we did with some roofing tiles, so we did some outdoor measurements, but uh, there are so many confounding particles drifting about on construction sites um, that we work inside the environmentally controlled chamber for, for all of our tests. And when we do that, as Gavin showed you, we do a broad range of tests from standard industrial hygiene measurements of, of how much is actually in the air for gravimetric uh, measurements of, of dust to real-time um, particle counters. Uh, so, uh, it, uh, unfortunately, it takes most of these to, to have a, a, a results that you feel comfortable with uh, as far as describing it. And, and I will say, as, as Gavin pointed out, the, the fact that NIOSH has put out some recommended exposure limits, are, it's extraordinarily helpful for us because uh, we then have a benchmark to compare against. Otherwise, you're not even sure uh, what's uh, reasonable as far as work exposure. There's still, you know, a whole lot of unknowns there. Sorry, that's, that's kind of best. Gavin, feel free to jump in. Well, the only thing I would add to that is that, um, you know, as Bruce said, I don't know if there's kind of one uh, particular measurement or instrument that, that will tell you everything you might want to know at this point. But the other thing is that it's a bit, the, the answer is perhaps a bit of a moving target because there are a lot of folks who are working on new instrumentation and methods and harmonization of, of methods. So um, it's, it's kind of a, a, a shifting answer and, you know, something to, to stay tuned and look at uh, what types of new measurement capabilities and devices we'll, we'll see coming down the pipeline. Thank you. What, one other point I would make is that in construction, uh, working on a job site, you have to worry about weather and, and huge amounts of dust from other sources. So instruments have to be robust, and we're going to be working with 
um, some NIOSH researchers to, to test out some of their real-time particle counters in the uh, construction environment just to see uh, how, how well they perform. I would also say one other thing, if you're dealing with a material that NIOSH does have a recommended exposure limit, i.e. carbon nanotubes, titanium oxide, or silver, they do stipulate the methodology they recommend for, for sampling, and I would hardly recommend you follow that as much as you can. Other questions, Jess? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, one last question. Do manufacturers need to declare on any label or other documentation that their product contains nanomaterials? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, if the manufacturers in this country, there's very little um, that um, is required. Um, the, um, the, the problem is that the OSHA hazard communication standard says that for materials that are hazardous materials that are less than 1% by weight in the pr product, uh, they don't have to declare, uh, it, put it onto a safety data sheet unless it's a carcinogen. So um, unfortunately, most of the um, materials we're talking about are not gonna necessarily make it to that, that threshold. So, uh, and even so, we have been looking at um, safety data sheets as has um, NIOSH and, and internationally, the Koreans, the, uh, the Australians, and they are not sufficient to protect workers. Most of them do not identify what is in the nanoscale uh, and if they do, they use uh, uh, permissible exposure limits from the larger material. Instead of carbon nanotubes, they use graphite. Uh, and, and so there's, there's a real problem uh, with that. Uh, and I just would like to point out that the International Standards Organization does have a recommended uh, approach to, to writing a good safety data sheet for nanomaterials, but quite frankly, we don't see it being followed much. If, if I could add to, uh, add to that Please. quickly, just a couple points. Um, uh, some cases where, where labeling might be required, I'm not fully familiar with the requirements, but I believe that if nanomaterials like, like silver are used uh, as, uh, as maybe a biocide, but I think it's more under uh, pesticide, uh, existing pesticide regulations from EPA, um, I think that that might require uh, some type of, of labeling, uh, but if you go, but if, if we, that slide I showed where the point I was making that we have a lot of metal oxides reported in the inventory, I didn't really point out that the bar above that was undetermined. So we will access as much product literature as possible, including the safety data sheets. And in, in many cases, uh, we can't, um, you know, there might, uh, there might be, it, it will be reported the nanomaterials are added but we might not, in many cases, we can't identify the chemical composition uh, from the product literature we review. Um, the one other thing is that uh, uh, there's something voluntary that some manufacturers are choosing to participate in. It's called uh, Health Product Declaration, uh, HPDs, and it's a type of initiative. I believe it might have been the nonprofit who started this idea, but it's kind of like a more transparent and more thorough and comprehensive version of a safety data sheet for manufacturers who would like to be proactive and very transparent. And there is a field um, on there that for each component listed on, on the health product declaration, there, there's a, a column you know, with a yes or no of whether that material is added as a nanoscale material. So I just thought that was worth mentioning as well. Okay, great, thank you. And we actually got one more question, and I think this one will be for you, Laura. Um, is there any, or are there any training materials available on, on nano? Um, in your study, did you come across um, any widely available training, um, or even Bruce and Gavin, um, do you know of any? Uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, no, we did not. I know. Bruce uh, has done training, and he can speak to that himself. But through the study, we did not uh, find any samples of training about nanotechnology in a general way, as in what does it mean, what is it? Um, it the only thing we, 
were aware of, as I said, a very tiny subset of people had actually received training and the majority was from a manufacturer. So it was more product information and um, encouragement to you know, use that, that product um, and how to apply it and how to uh, work with materials handling of that, but not comprehensive training about nanotechnology and its role in construction. And what we found even with the government uh, staffers that we talked to is they didn't even know how many material, materials or, or how those materials are actually being used in the real world of construction. So for some of them, I mentioned the LCOSH inventory list and they needed to go find that themselves. So when it comes down to actual uh, frontline workers or union reps, uh, we found really nothing out there in the way of um, of training. Ms. Bruce, I'd just like to, to build on that. And, and there, we put together, uh, Dr. Kristen Kolonowski, who was with Rice University at the time, and, and I put together a seven module uh, training program, uh, but that was really aimed at health and safety uh, experts, not not necessarily workers, and and so that's been out. That was an OSHA grant. It's on the Good Nano Guide. It's also on the OSHA uh, Hardwood uh, Training Site, uh, and it's been downloaded 50,000 times. Individual modules from uh, from the Good Nano Guide, uh, but we're also working uh, on putting together something more in the train the trainer. Uh, that would have a small small unit uh, that would go into other training programs like HAZWAP or Refresher that would just be focused on what workers need to know. Um, so I, yeah, I would just want to mention that. And if I could add on again to dovetailing on what Bruce just said, what, what we found is that most of the people who were being trained in, in terms of occupational health training were actually laboratory workers who were involved in manufacturing the nanomaterials. It wasn't going beyond that out into, as Bruce said, down to you know, end users or um, contractors. Uh, at least we didn't turn any of that up through our study. Okay, thank you everyone. And I got one more question. I promise I'm cutting it off after this. Um, but uh, the question is, can non-nano particles break down into nanoparticles during sanding or grinding? Um, Any type well, of, uh, go ahead, go ahead, okay. Go ahead, Bruce, please. No, I just want to say that any type of abrasive, mechanical abrasive action against a, a material uh, even if it has no nanoparticles added to it, can, can potentially generate particles in that size range of one to a hundred nanometers, which is the definition for a nanoparticle. Um, what, what we're concerned about is the engineered nanoparticles, those materials that have been added. But yes, uh, the big question is when you sand materials that have engineered nanoparticles in them, do they become, do they come out freely as those particles or are they stuck in other pieces of wood or, or plaster? And we seem to see more of the latter uh, than the former, certainly. Gavin, you want to add to that? Yeah, and, and, and what, what uh, uh, some researchers have reported is, is um, you know, combustion. So, so it's known that welding fumes, for example, contain nanoparticles. And so when you have uh, combustion processes that take place that you know, could happen with power tools. That could be the, the source of, of nanoparticle emissions. And, uh, and, and you know, there, there are um, naturally occurring nanomaterials and incident, uh, you know, kind of process generated nanomaterials. And so what we're focused on studying is, is the engineered or manufactured nanomaterials. Um, and, and as far as the, the uh, non-nanoparticles breaking down during sanding or, or grinding, um, you know, I would say yes, it's documented, documented from, from tools and combustion, uh, whether, you know, the, the, the material that you're sanding or grinding itself breaks down into nanoparticles. I don't know if there's um, uh, data on that. I, I would think that the, uh, 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 well, actually there are some papers where, they, where they've shown um, some 
from electron microscopy, from dust samples, from from ordinary Portland cement that was not that, to which no nanoparticles were added. Um, uh, but there is a process of, of manufacturing or, or creating manu nanoparticles where you know it's it's mill milling, and they're milling it down from a larger substance. So uh, there is kind of a mechanism for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you, Laura, Gavin, and Bruce for presenting and for staying on for a full hour with us today. Um, if anyone has questions that did not get answered, please feel free to email me or any of our presenters. And again, I will be sending out a recording and other links uh, hopefully tomorrow. Um, so have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Happy holidays.